we finished our last class and we were talking about the ecclesia as a vibrant body, a living thing. Remember we looked at that term, a living God. He was, the Lord was the son of the living God, said Peter, and this was a living, vibrant body, this ecclesia. And I talked about the bricks in the wall. Well, I was informed I had the wall wrong. It's the wall behind me where the bricks are, not the ones on the side. But the principle's there. We're being shaped. We're alive. This is a vibrant, living body that we're talking about. So to commence this evening, let's go into Ephesians chapter 4. What we want to talk about this evening is how this ecclesia, this vibrant body, can remain vital, can, can remain strong and healthy. And in Ephesians chapter 4, we read about this body in verse uh, uh, 12, that it is being edified. It's the edifying of the body of Christ. So here we've got the edification of the ecclesia. And that what we're doing in verse 13, this body is growing to be a mature man, a mature body, measuring against the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, there's another little phrase you can follow through the scriptures, particularly uh, the word fullness you'll see uh, is used by Paul in Colossians and so on. The fullness of Christ. In other words, our Lord was the fullness of his Father here on earth. He was the fullness of the character of the God we worship. And so the ecclesia is to grow into the fullness of that character. And in in doing that, in verse 14, we will henceforth no more be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So with this maturity, this body will be able to recognise whether or not things are true or false. And it will be able to make decisions about the strengthening of itself. In verse 15, it will speak the truth in love and it will grow up into him, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our head. Now, the picture that the Apostle Paul is describing here is this body which starts as a young child, And as it matures and grows, because it feeds upon the word of God, it aspires to grow up into its head. Now, if you've got a bit of a vivid imagination, what what Paul is telling us is this. Here's a head. This head is Christ. Now, what's in a head? A brain. What's he talking about? He's talking about the thinking of the Lord Jesus Christ. Never once did that man, during his human existence allow the thinking of the mind to lead him into sin. So here's this head. This represents the fullness of God. And here's a body, an infant, that is growing up. And what it's doing is it's aspiring to reach that head. And what it does, as it matures, it grows up into that body. And it locks into that head. So here we are, we're a living body. And our objective is to grow so that we can become thinkers like Christ. And we can allow the thinking of the Lord Jesus Christ to control our minds to the point that in some way in us will be seen the fullness of the character of God. And that's what Paul's describing to us. Verse 16. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth. Let's just stop there. What it's telling us is that in this process, every single part of that body will be required. Nothing will be omitted. For us to grow and to lock into our head, for this this ecclesia, this vibrant body, to become like God, to think like the Lord Jesus Christ, Every member will be required. And what we read is that it's according to the effectual working in the measure of every part. 
it will make increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Now, what was the only power, remember at our last class, what was the only power that made it possible for individual members to think the way Caleb did? My brethren, 38 years ago, made a decision. Moses never separated himself from the ecclesia. As, as disobedient as those people were, as much as they ridiculed him, what was the power? The only power possible was love. And that's what Paul's telling us here. It's the edifying of itself in love. Now, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 16, here's a couple of other translations. The diaglot's a literal translation. From whom the whole body being fitly joined and united by means of every assisting joint, according to the proportionate energy of each single part. We can't miss the point, can we? It's telling us that every single individual, every part that makes up that body is required. It affects the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Without exemption, every part is required. And Weymouth puts it, dependent on him, the whole body, its various parts closely fitting and firmly adhering to one another, grows by the aid of every contributing ligament with power proportioned to the need of each individual part. So your body, my body, is providing within itself for the needs of that body. Your heart is providing oxygen to the rest of your body, etc. So your body parts are providing for the needs of the other parts of your body. So as to build up in a spirit of love. Now, that's the principle that we were talking about last week that Paul is now describing to us. How then do all the parts of the body provide for the other parts of the body to make that body strong and healthy and vibrant? And that's what we want to talk about. And we're going to start by going back to our reading in Ezra chapter 3. Now, this was our daily reading a few days ago. And uh, we're going to also have a look at Nehemiah chapter 8, which is going to be our reading in a few days' time. So I expect you'll know all about Ezra chapter 3, because we've only read that just in the recent few days. So, Ezra chapter 3. It, it, by the way, Ezra 3 and Nehemiah 8 are written at exactly the same time. In Ezra chapter 3, we're told in verse 1, when the seventh month was come and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. Now, just keep your hand there. It's only a couple of pages over. Flick over to Nehemiah chapter 8, or chapter 7 actually, the very last verse, so that we get the context so we know. In verse 73 of chapter 7, so the priests and the Levites, the porters, the singers and some of the people and the Nethanims and all Israel dwelled in their cities and when the seventh month came. So he then goes on in chapter 8. So Nehemiah 8 is written at exactly the, and about the same things as Ezra chapter 3. And while you're in, um, in Nehemiah, have a look at verse 13. On the second day were gathered together the chief of the fathers of all the people the priests and the Levites, unto Ezra the scribe, even to understand the words of the law. And they found written in the law, etc., etc. And at the end of that, verse 14, what did they read? They had to go out and dwell in booths in the feast of the seventh month. Now come back to Ezra chapter 3. So we're talking about the seventh month. And included in that seventh month was the feast of booths. We know that to be the feast of tabernacles. So... In uh, chapter 3, verse 4, they kept also the Feast of Tabernacles, as it is written. Now, what happened in Ezra chapter 3 and in Nehemiah 8? Have a look at verse 2. Then stood up Joshua, the son of Josedach, and his brethren the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren, and builded the altar of God to offer burnt offerings thereon, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. So the first thing we note is that until now, 
they'd been, they'd come back to the land, but formal worship had not commenced. What they've done now, according to Moses' description, they've now built the altar and they're now offering burnt offerings. So it's the commencement of formal worship. Verse, uh, verse um, uh, 4, they kept the Feast of Tabernacles. Verse 5, after they offered the continual burnt offerings. And verse 6, from the first day of the seventh month began they to offer burnt offerings unto Yahweh. So here is the very beginning of commencement of worship in a formal sense after the children of of Judah have come back from captivity and gone into the land. Now, the end of verse 6, it tells us, but the foundation of the temple of Yahweh was not yet laid. So they haven't even commenced any form of building project. The temple's not laid, there's nothing there. All they've done is they've built the altar and they've commenced worship. But what that's telling us, brethren and sisters, is this. The commencement of that worship... And the fact that they took out the law of Moses and went through that to understand what they needed to do became the impetus for them to go the next step and to commence their building project. And that's what Esther 3 and Nehemiah 8 described to us. What brought this ecclesia to life? They opened their Bible and they read what Moses said. Ah, we need an altar. So they build an altar. Oh, we've got daily burnt offerings. Ah, it's the seventh month. And we'll look at a moment, the things that had to be done in the seventh month. It's the seventh month. Ah, we should really, we should lay foundations. We should rebuild the temple. And it became the impetus for them to pick up the worship of God that the body might be strengthened. And we know from our readings, don't we? There are all sorts of issues in Nehemiah. He describes all sorts of threats, all sorts of difficulties that were going to come upon them. But alongside that, they'd now opened their Bible and they understood that they had a responsibility on behalf of the whole ecclesia, not only to commence worship, but for that worship to be done in a way that had been prescribed by God through Moses, the man of God. So what happened in the seventh month? Well, you might remember in Exodus chapter 12, when they came out of the land, in Exodus chapter 12, the Passover was kept. And God said to Moses, this will be a beginning of months to you. So the month Abib, the first month of the religious Jewish year, we had the Passover. The Jewish year was a funny year because we had a religious year and then we had a civil year. So this seventh month that we're talking about here is the seventh month in the religious year, which became the the first month of their civil year. And what had happened during the year, if we think about the Jewish year, so if we started off in the first month of the religious year, what we do is as we come around to the seventh month, we've had the growing season. And... They've had rain that has come in the latter months of the the Jewish uh, religious year. And then as the year progressed, they had harvest. Then they had the grapes and the fruit. And summer had completed and they brought all that in. And at the end of that period of time, we get to the seventh month. And by this point... All of the harvest is complete. All of the fruits have been taken. The grapes have been taken. The figs. Everything's been done. And now the year starts all over again. And in the civil year, it's like our January the 1st. It's the beginning of their year. But you see, they did it by seasons. So summer's complete and now autumn starts. And with the beginning of autumn, they are now looking to prepare their fields for planting for the next year because in another two or three months autumn becomes winter and they get their early and latter rains and so the seventh month is that in between month between the completion of harvest and the beginning of sowing, ploughing and sowing 
And it's that month that we're talking about right here, the seventh month. And in the seventh month, this is what happened. On the first day, we had the Feast of Trumpets. There was a blasting of the trumpet. And if you look at Revelation 11, that's telling us that the kingdom of God is going to appear. And to the Jew, it was the beginning of a new season. It was something new that was going to happen. It symbolised the kingdom of God that's going to be established upon the earth. And then, on the tenth day, was the most holy day of the year. The Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. And what did that talk about? It talked about the prospect of the forgiveness of sins. Of death being overcome. That eternal life is going to be made possible. And the Jew... The spiritual Jew would look at the events of that day, see the involvement of a high priest, see the involvement of two goats and would see in the sacrifice the two parts, one where one goat died, one where one goat lived and their sins were being removed from them and this gave them the hope of eternal life that a great high priest was going to come. And Paul speaks about that in the book of Hebrews. And the third thing that happened in that month was on the 15th day, the Feast of Tabernacles began and they had seven days. And the next day after that was a Sabbath day. They had to stop and think about all the things that had happened during that seventh month. And what did the Feast of Tabernacles? It was a period of rejoicing with families. And we get the picture of the prophets that every man living under his own vine and his own fig tree and none making him afraid. And it's the reality, brethren and sisters, of sins forgiven and eternal life. It's the reality. And there they were as an ecclesia, all living in booths with their families, rejoicing that God had made a proclamation, things are going to be different, the blast of the trumpet, A new life was going to come. The Lord Jesus Christ was going to come into the world. He was going to defeat sin. He was going to be resurrected and open up the way of life eternal. And they had that prospect. And then they went out in the Feast of Tabernacles to rejoice that God had done that on their behalf. And these people on the seventh month began worship. First day of the month with a blast of a trumpet. And what happened on that day, brethren and sisters? Well, here's the ecclesia. Now, I know this is a reading we've already done, but when we get to Nehemiah 8, I'm I'm big for colouring in words. So if you're looking for an exercise to do with your children while you're doing the readings in Nehemiah 8, explain that Ezra 3 is a comparative chapter and come back here and do these colouring in projects. What was the strength? What basis was it that this ecclesia operated on? Verse 1. When the seventh month was come and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. There's our basis. Every single member gathered together. Verse 8. Now in the second year of their coming unto the house of God at Jerusalem in the second month began Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, and the remnant of their brethren, and the priests and the Levites, and all that were come out of captivity unto Jerusalem. And they appointed the Levites from 20 years old and upward to set forward the work of the house of Yahweh. So here we are, we get a little while down the track. The impetus of what had happened at the beginning of that seventh month as now pushing forward the work. Verse 11. And they sang together by course, in praising and giving thanks unto Yahweh, because he is good and his mercy endureth forever toward all Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised Yahweh, because the foundation of the house of Yahweh was laid. So from the beginning to the end of that project. The thing we can't miss is that this ecclesia worked together to ensure that every single member was provided for and strengthened. Now, isn't that what we just read in Ephesians chapter 4? 
Here they were together as one. And look at the spirit of the Ecclesia, verse 5. And afterward offered the continual burnt offering both on the new moons and of all the set feasts of Yahweh that were consecrated and of everyone that willingly offered a free will offering unto Yahweh. You know, you, you participate in an event like that and that spirit is infectious. And they willingly offered. They said, yes, in fact, verse 7, they gave money also to the masons, to the carpenters, and meat and drink and oil unto them of Zion, etc., etc. They just didn't hold back. The spirit, the strength of that ecclesia was that every member got involved. Every member. And do you, did you know who led this? It was Ezra. And who did he call? The Levites and the priests. And what was their role? Their role was to understand the word of God and to teach the rest of the nation. So what's this based on? It's based on they took the words of Moses, the man of God. And that became the foundation for the development of that spirit. And so when we get to verse 10... What did the people all acknowledge? And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of Yahweh, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets, the Levites, the sons of Asaph with cymbals, to praise Yahweh after the ordinance of, the, of David, king of Israel. We'll come back to that in a moment. And they sang together by course in praising and giving thanks unto Yahweh because he is good, for his mercy endureth forever toward Israel. And everyone shouted out and they praised Yahweh because the foundation of the house of Yahweh was laid. What are they saying? We didn't do all this. This is the work of God. They didn't attribute to themselves, did they? Here they were, moved by the power of God's word. And a man like Ezra could stand up as he did on this occasion and broke small the word of God and the Levites were with him. He'd, he'd actually already had a Bible class with the Levites and he'd explained to them what it was he was going to talk about. And those Levites went around amongst the, the ecclesia, amongst that nation and they broke small the things that uh, Ezra said. And that was the impetus that drove this ecclesia on. And that's why this work was completed. One of the sad things that we read is that verse 12 and 13, even in the midst of that, we're human. We're human beings. We bear human nature. And it has all its weaknesses. And in the middle of all of that, this work is completed. It's a work of God. And there was a problem. And I think there's a great lesson for us out of this. And it's probably true of every ecclesia. And that is that sometimes not all of our older members and all of our younger members perhaps see things in exactly the same way. And that was true here. And while some were uplifted and inspired by the fact that that work had been completed. Others looked at it and thought, it's not as good as it used to be. And sometimes in ecclesial life, we, we face that sort of issue, don't we? And we need to find our way through that. But for these people, it caused a hold-up. That's not the purpose of our discussion tonight because I want us to be inspired by where we got to here. But there is, there is a little word of warning in there for us to make sure as best we can that every member is being taken along and included and sees the, the, the vitality of the outcome, that it's there to strengthen and to encourage and to vitalise every single member of the ecclesia. Now, back to verse 10. Right at the end it says, after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And you'll see in your margin you get a cross-reference to 1 Chronicles. I'd like us just to go back there, please. 1 Chronicles 15. So they've opened up the writings 
of Moses. But they also, somewhere along there, they had a record of what David had done. And clearly, they had a record of 1 Chronicles 15 and 1 Chronicles 16, and maybe even Psalm 24, David's writing. But in 1 Chronicles 15, let's just have a look and see what this chapter is actually telling us. Because we need to understand, we've just read in Ezra 3 that they opened up Moses' words, they did this and they, they got excited and they... But there's a lot more to it than that, brethren and sisters. You look at 1 Chronicles 15. We read that David, verse 16, spake to the chief of the Levites. So David goes to the Levites. Guess what? That's what Ezra did. David goes to the Levites and he says, look, we need to get organised to bring the ark up to Jerusalem. Remember, it's in the house of Obed-Edom. We've got to get it up to Jerusalem. We, we need to do this properly. It's been a disaster till now. We need to do this properly. And to do this, I'm going to need your help. So three men in verse 17 are selected. Heman, Asaph and Ethan. And those three men are made responsible. And this is what we read if you come across verse 19. So the singers, Heman, Asaph and Ethan were appointed to sound with symbols of brass. So they were given they were the responsibility, if you like, of the orchestra. So here were the Levites, and it was their role to provide the orchestra that was going to accompany, in verse 20, a number of other uh, uh, brethren who were with, it reads at the end of verse 20, with salt trees... On Alamoth. So there were eight brethren, and then we read there were also those with salt trees on Alamoth. Well, if you like to go into the Hebrew, you'll see that that actually refers to female singers. So what we've got, in actual fact, as we look down through this, down to verse 21, there's another group of brethren who had harps on the Sheminith, and in your margin it will say, on the eighth to oversee. But the Hebrew actually means male singers to lead or excel. So what's being described here? There's an orchestra, there's a choir of male singers, and there's a choir of female singers. And David has organised this. He's gone to the Levites. He said, what I want is an orchestra, a male choir, and a female choir. Oh, and by the way, in verse 4... Chenaniah, the chief of the Levites, was for song. He instructed about the song because he was skilful. I want a conductor. And Chenaniah was appointed. And I also need some gatekeepers, some doorkeepers. So in verse 23, Berechiah and Elkanah were doorkeepers for the ark. Now, we don't have time tonight, but if you'd like to go to Psalm 24, you know... Um, lift up your gates. You can go through Psalm 24 and that psalm is written by David for two choirs and there are two doorkeepers and there is demand for the gates to be open and the doorkeepers say, who is the king of glory? Yahweh, mighty and strong. And that, brethren and sisters, is what Ezra 3, that's what Ezra did. He said to these people, and this is what Moses said, we need an ark, we, uh, uh, an altar built. We need to make sure that we are offering in the terms of Moses, the man of God. Now let's go back to see what David said. And that's what he did, brethren and sisters, in 1 Chronicles 15. That's how David brought the ark up to Jerusalem. And on that day, in my mind, it's quite clear that Ezra organised a similar activity and it lifted everyone's spirit. And they worked together, singers, orchestras, conductors, doorkeepers, didn't matter what our role was, everybody. Ephesians chapter 4, every single part of that ecclesia 
was involved in providing for the benefit of every other part. Why? So that it could grow up into its head. That we could be lifted in mind and spirit to become like Christ. And that's what Ezra chapter 3 is describing for us. You know, there is a word in the Old Testament that's equivalent to the word ecclesia in the New Testament. And it's the Hebrew word migra. Just come across to Nehemiah chapter 8. It's actually used here. And the translators couldn't work out what this word was all about. And they translated it in Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 8 as the very last word, reading. So here we are. Ezra has organised the day. We know this is the, the, the same day, verse 1. So Ezra the scribe brought out the book of the law of Moses, which Yahweh had commanded, and away they went. And we get to verse... Uh, well, let's just take verse, um, verse 6. So Ezra blessed Yahweh the great God and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with the lifting up of their hands and they bowed their heads and worshipped Yahweh with their faces to the ground. So what, did, what happened? Well, as Ezra spoke about the word of God, he elicited from the people of Israel, from that whole nation, everyone listening, all 40 odd thousand of them that were listening, he elicited from them this, this response, blessed be God. They were so thankful for the words that Ezra had spoken. And look in verse 7, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akab, etc. Caused the people to understand the law and the people stood in their place. They were transfixed because there we are, Ezra is standing, uh, it, it's um, called a pulpit at one stage in verse 4. Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood, so they built a wooden platform. And there he is standing in front of the whole congregation. And around that congregation are all these Levites of verse 7. And they've got little groups around them. And Ezra would say something. And then they'd have a little individual study group with this Levite. And he'd explain. You know, you know what Ezra said, don't you? This is what he meant. This is what the law says. And everyone listened to that. And they understood and they stood transfixed because God's word was broken small. You want to strengthen the ecclesia of God? You feed the ecclesia of God. That's what we're learning, aren't we? So they read in verse 8, in the book, in the law of God, distinctly. And that word means to break in pieces. It was broken down. So everyone understood. And they gave the sense. And the RV says it was given with an interpretation. So nobody was left saying, hey, excuse me, excuse me, brother Sheb and I, I, I don't understand that. Oh, right, -o. well, brother, this is what it means. I'll give you the interpretation. Everybody understood. They had the sense, they had an interpretation. And they caused them to understand. And then it says the reading. And it's this Hebrew word migra, which literally means to be called out. So what's it mean? Well, the translators looked at that and said, well, we don't understand what that means. But you see, we know what it means. We know that by the time those people understood the law of God, they now understood They'd been called out to be something different. That's what it's telling us, isn't it? They understood the reading. They understood what they'd been called out to. It's like you and I. We open up our Bible and we see within the scripture some very distinct teachings. And we grasp onto that. We mentally understand that. And we now say, ah, oh, that's what God meant. Oh, I can see now why we're different why we don't believe this or we don't believe that or why we teach this because that's what's in the Bible and that makes us different. That's why we're called out. And you can pick that up, can't you, in the book of Revelation. We've got the great whore and all of those that go along with it. And over here, you've got a woman 
Same thing, a woman, but she's so different. That's what these people are beginning to understand. Don't forget, they've been 70 years in Babylon. And they're now having explained to them why they're God's people, what that means, what Moses meant. And they got this great Bible student, Ezra, who stood up in front of them and he's educated his brethren and they've broken that down and every single member listening has understood what this means. So, Nehemiah chapter 8, pencils again, when you get to this in your readings, they gather as one, verse 1, all the people gathered themselves together as one man. What did they gather to do, verse 3? To read the word of God. All the people, he read therein, at the end of the verse, all the people were attentive. Verse 6. And Ezra blessed Yahweh the great God and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with the lifting up of their hands and they worshipped Yahweh with their faces to the ground. Verse 7. They came to hear and to understand. Verse 12. And all the people went their way to eat and to drink and to send portions and to make great mirth because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. And having understood that, brethren and sisters, it brought great joy. And what did it do? Verse 16. So the people went forth and brought them and made themselves booths, every man upon the roof of his house, and so commenced a week of rejoicing. Based on what? That they understood the word of God. They'd had it broken down for them. They knew now their responsibilities before God. They were enthused to get out and do the work. And we get down to verse 18. Also day by day from the first day unto the last day, he read in the book of the law of God. And they kept the feast seven days and on the eighth day was a solemn assembly according unto the manner. They came back every day to learn more. Now that's the spirit. You want to know how to strengthen the ecclesia? How do we go about it? Well, we all have a part to play. And that is to make sure that the word of God is broken down and understood and that together as one big family, we are rejoicing in the fact of what God has done on our behalf, that we build the spirit of the ecclesia. Now, you wouldn't be surprised to know, of course, that that's exactly the same principles that applied in the ecclesia in the New Testament. Here's another little exercise we can go through if you haven't done this with your children. What was the strength of the ecclesia in the New Testament? Well, let's go across to Acts chapter 1. I suppose most of you will have uh, coloured this in in your Bible. But in Acts chapter 1 and verse 12, they returned from, uh, uh, to Jerusalem uh, from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. And they were listed who they were. They came into that upper room and in verse 14 they continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with all his brethren. We just read that in Ezra. That was the basis. Verse, uh, verse um, um, chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. But we can't miss these points, can we? Because there was a fundamental teaching that drew these people together. Verse 42 of chapter 2. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in breaking bread and in prayers. That's what makes up our ecclesia. First of all, there is a fundamental basis we meet on. The truth of the word of God, the doctrine. We share then fellowship because we are drawn together. We have a commonality of purpose. And we break bread. We celebrate together the fact 
who it is that has made that possible. God has provided his only son. And it elicits from us, brethren and sisters, prayers of thankfulness. That's how our ecclesia in the first century, right through to now, has been brought together. And in verse 46, they continued daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house. They did eat their meat with singleness, with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favour with all the people. And the Lord added to the ecclesia daily such as should be saved. God bless that. Because that was the spirit that was seen within the vibrancy of that ecclesia. So, how do we? Well, we don't, not all of us, um, get to stand up and break small the word of God. But if you've got someone in your meeting that has the capacity to do that, you encourage that because the ecclesia will benefit. You use that. You, you let that brother do that. You give that brother the opportunity. And then we have other brethren and sisters who are able to move amongst the ecclesia and talk about those things and encourage. And then in families, we've got mums and dads who do the readings with their kids and they colour in words and they talk about things and they instil that into the mind of those little, little kids. So they grow up to appreciate your dedication to the things of God and the, the, the clarification there is between what the world is and what we are. You're going to strengthen the ecclesia by doing that because you're providing a generation to come. And then you've got the energy and vibrancy of those children and those young people as they grow. For people of codgers like me who need that. We need to see individuals who are, are, are keen and active because you start to run out a bit of a puffer after a while, don't you? For those of us that are a little older in years. We need that behind us. And it's that spirit that will drive the ecclesia on. The vibrancy and the vitality of the ecclesia will be driven by that. You know, our ecclesia, and I'm talking now worldwide, I'm not saying our ecclesia as in Cumberland or Glenlock or whatever, but our ecclesia is based on two things. What we believe and that we dedicate ourselves to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that you think about it. That's what our ecclesia is. It's made up of a group of individuals who have a commonality of belief We've opened God's word and we've believed it. We accept what God says is true. And we accept that he provided his son. And as best we can in our life, we have said to our God that we will do to the best we can. We will do what we can to follow the Lord. And that means there are some practical outcomes of that in our life. This isn't just theory, is it? There's got to be the practice of what we believe. It's one thing to say that we believe something. But how in practice does that affect my life? I think it was... Um, I'm trying to think who it was. Brother Sergeant, I think, who made a comment in talking about uh, the judgment seat. And he said words something like this, that when we get to the judgment seat, it won't be so much what we've espoused we believe. It'll be what we've done with what we believe. And he quoted Matthew chapter 25 and verse 40. And this is what it is. Inasmuch as ye have done it unto the one of the least of these my brethren... You've done it unto me. I'm fairly certain it was Brother Sergeant in the teachings of the Master. I stand to be corrected, but certainly an English brother, I'm pretty certain it was Brother Ma uh, Sergeant. But you think about that, brethren and sisters. It's what we believe and committing ourselves 
to being a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. What you've done unto the least of one of these, my brethren, you've done unto me. James put it this way. Pure religion and undefiled before... Actually, he had something. I, I almost missed it out. Before God and the Father. Now, let's just stop there. You know, you could have left and the Father out, couldn't you? But he adds, and the Father. Why? Because he goes on to say, pure religion is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. So James reminds us that God is a father. He had feelings toward his son. And he has feelings toward all his sons and daughters. And it's our responsibility, says James, to care for all his sons and daughters. He's a father. We have to be like that in our life and have, have, have the same feelings toward those around, particularly those who find themselves in difficult circumstances, the fatherless and the widows. And again, that's the practical aspect of strengthening the ecclesia of God. So what have we learned? Well, we learned, haven't we, as we've gone through, this body, it's alive, but it doesn't have a head. And it's only young. It's immature. What it has to do is to mature and grow to a point that it meets its head. It becomes Christ-like. And how does it do that? Well, it does that by understanding what the scriptures say. We understand what God has said in speaking to us through his word. And then we take that And we apply that in a practical sense by growing, not only to have a mind like Christ, but to be able to apply ourselves in our daily life just like him. And to think past ourselves and to consider others, particularly those who find themselves in very difficult circumstances. Now let's finish in Galatians chapter 6. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, let's just stop there. So we've got a brother who's got a problem. So Paul says, we've got a brother with a problem. But who's he actually addressing? Is he addressing the brother with the problem? No, he's not, is he? He's actually talking to you who are spiritual. So we've got someone that's got some sort of issue. Now, says Paul, how's that going to be dealt with? Well, hold on, you brethren that are spiritual. You've got to have two qualities to meet that. The first of those is you've got to have a spirit of meekness. And the second is, before ever we can work on restoration, we have to also be very much aware of our own weakness. So we've got someone over here that's got a problem. So we say, well, look, we'll get a couple of uh, brethren to go over and deal with that. So you two, off you go and deal with this problem. We've got to go and sort this brother out. Now, before we go, what's the attitude? Well, if a brother is spiritual, says Paul, he'll go there in meekness. He's not going there to lecture anyone. He's going there in meekness. And he's going to go there fully understanding that like every other brother or sister, he too suffers with human nature and all its frailties. 
Now, on that basis, says the Apostle Paul, if you don't think like that, you know what the problem is? You yourself may very well fail when it comes to the time of temptation. And I think all of us can probably think of a time where we may have been critical of someone, we may even have spoken to someone about something, and lo and behold, sometime later, guess what? We fail in the same or similar way ourselves. And that's what Paul's telling us. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfil the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. So here's the brother that says, yeah, look, I'll go and sort that out. I don't have a problem like that. I got it all under control. Paul says, be very careful. Be very careful. You've deceived yourself. And in ecclesial life, that's an important principle for us, isn't it? In all the ways we deal with each other. Not just when we feel that someone's got a problem, but in all the ways we deal with each other. That we have that attitude of mind which says, look, I'm no better than anyone else. And I'm not setting myself up. I'm considering that I too suffer with the frailties common to human nature. Paul summarises in verse 4, but let every man prove his own work and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Now, I'm going to, we're going to finish by looking at the translation of that in a couple of other places. Weymouth puts it this way. But let every man scrutinise his own conduct and then he'll have reason for boasting, not by comparison with someone else, but in regard to himself. So here's the brother saying, yeah, I'll go and sort him out. I've never done anything like that myself. He's worse than me. My, you know, my greatest uh, ability to be, to be responsible for sorting him out is I'm not as bad as him. Paul said, no, no, there's no comparison here. It's not that one isn't as bad as the other. You can't work on a comparison. You've got to regard yourself. And the New English Bible puts it this way. Each man should examine his own conduct for himself. Then he can measure his achievements by comparing himself with himself not with anyone else. So the basis upon which we deal with each other within the ecclesia is no comparison of who's better or worse. It's about saying, how do I measure up? I've learnt what's in the Bible. I understand God's provided his son. How well do I measure against the head that I'm supposed to have grown up into. And when we can sort that out, brethren and sisters, when we can be honest, then we're in a position to try and help someone else. And Paul says, until then, we're not. Now, I hope that's been of some value. That the way an ecclesia gets strong is vibrant and is a living, strong body, is by every part being involved. And that all starts by us opening our Bibles and understanding. And every one of us has a part to play in that within the ecclesia. And when we've done that, to look at how that should affect our lives and measure ourselves against the Lord Jesus Christ, not against one another, and we'll find we come far short. I hope that's been useful. And I look forward in some form or another, finishing another couple of classes with you over the couple of weeks ahead, if that's uh, possible.